All right. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Good to see everybody here this morning. A little bit dreary outside, but hey, it's, it's, it's not snow, so we're happy with that. Spring is in the air, right? Um, just got some new songs playing this morning. Just uh, thankful to Tracy. Tracy does a lot of work here. You know, I think we should all be very appreciative of all the work Tracy does and Bobby too. Like, yes, yeah, that's, they do a lot of hard work for us and, and just put a lot of energy into things. So we're certainly appreciative of both you guys for everything that you do. So it helps really uh, make everything come together. Uh, so again, uh, spring is in the year. I did my first uh, mowing session of the year, I guess. You know, I usually put it off as long as I can because like once you start mowing, then it's just, you got to keep up with it. Uh, and so I'm kind of the point now where I'm like, well, it's getting, getting to the point where if I wait too long, like in the week or so, then it gets so thick where you're like pushing the mower and it's getting caught in the mower. And you got to lift it up and it stops. And, and, and this is, by the way, this is still the mower that I have that I broke like a year or two ago that I, I hit the metal lentil and it just tore the entire like casing, the entire uh, engine right off of the top of the mower. But I got it welded. I'm like, you know what, this is brand new. I'm going to see if I can, my uncle welded it. So I'm still going to get a couple, uh, maybe seasons out of it. And then it kind of shakes a little bit, but it gets the job done. It gets the job done. But anyway, mowing season underway, but now my allergies are kind of kicking up now because of all the grass and things like that. Um, what else is going on? Oh, I, um, I decided, you know, since spring is coming up and summertime, I, I, I bought a new pair of shorts. You know, I don't, you know, buy a lot of, uh, you know, clothes per se, but I, I, this pair of shorts I wanted to get, they don't make any more kind of out of stock or the only size they're kind of like on sale, but not my size. So I found a pair though, I ordered them and they came in one of those, you know, bags they ship them in. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kind of in a hurry. I, I, getting the bag open, I, plunge my scissors into the bag, and I'm sure you know where this is going. And as I'm doing it, I'm like, this probably isn't a good idea as I make one cut, and then, yeah, I cut, I cut, the, I cut my shorts. <laughs> I'm like, oh, what am I, like, it's one of those things where my mind is like thinking, hey, you shouldn't do this as you're doing it, and then as I close the scissors, I can feel it kind of cutting the fabric. But anyway, it's not bad, just like a little tiny cut on the, on the side, but. Oh, just when you when you when you speed up, that's kind of what happens. All right. Well, that's my summary of the week. Uh, this morning we are continuing right in First Chronicles. That's the book that we're in. Uh, if you remember, we if, if you haven't been following, we were working through the books of the Bible, and we started with Genesis, and now we are in First Chronicles. And obviously, the purpose is for us to better understand what the Bible is. Like, what are these books about? What does it mean? What are they, why are they being written? And what can we learn from them? Not only from that perspective, but just from a spiritual side of things. Because uh, again, sometimes we read these books and we don't know what are they about. Because really, it's really important when we read the Bible that we know what kind of book we're reading. Because it better helps you understand it, what the purpose was. You know, that's one of the first things you learn in seminary is when you're, you know, reading and going through Scripture. And and um, you know, the big word is homil or her hermeneutics, or or that's the big fancy word as you go through the Bible and, and study in depth. Um, or your exegesis is the fancy words they use. But anyways, who are they writing to? What is the period and all that kind of stuff? Because it helps you better understand what the purpose of the book is. So as we usually do, is the author, the author of the book of First Chronicles doesn't specifically say, although tradition has it's the prophet uh, or, uh, of Ezra, actually, written by Ezra. That's kind of the tradition, First and Second Chronicles, written by Ezra. Um, they know, they, they basically gather, one of the main things is that the style of writing is like very, very, very similar and, and as far as the book of Ezra goes, like how things are written, the way they're ordered, that's a kind of indication. Also, there's a, some phrasing that's the exact phrasing that's used, and so that's part of the way they can kind of connect the dots. Also, time period is one way that they do it as well in terms of tradition. Date of writing, likely between 450, 425 BC. Uh, and then here's the big thing, okay, well, why was this book written? Uh, this book was written to uh, the Israelites, or people that were returning out of exile, right? So they were taken into captivity, but now they're starting to come back. And so this was written to people to encourage them. Um, they've been going through a lot of bad stuff, a lot of, um, lot of hardships. They were in captivity, so this was written primarily to encourage them and teach them to remember how to worship God, to remind them that they were God's um, specific chosen people. Uh, a lot of the information is the same. Actually, when you read like uh, 1 Kings and 2 Kings, or even 1 Kings, 2, 2 Samuel, or 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, like a lot of the information is the same. But there's a little bit of a different flavor to it, a little bit of a different, there's kind of a priestly focus too on this, but we'll get into that in a second. Um, in high points, of course, we, chapter 17 is God's promise to David and David's prayer for response. It's kind of a main, one of the main focuses. You know, uh, some people 
when you when you read First Chronicles, if you've read anyone read First Chronicles, have you, have you been through First Chronicles? Are you reading through now? Maybe. Well, if you do, uh, you'll know it can be a challenging book. And uh, some people even say, well, why even bother going through it? Because it covers basically the same material you already read. You know, it's covering a lot of the same stuff. Um, but there is some differences. There are some focuses that you might miss otherwise if you just kind of gloss through it. So this morning. We're going to do like an overview, just kind of walking through uh, quickly of just what, what they're talking about. Some of it will be review, and then we'll actually focus in a little bit on what we can learn from this as we go through. So if we begin, chapters 1 through 9 begins with the genealogy. Uh, if, you've, I mean, if you've read this book and you open it, this is, whew, it's like just genealogy, genealogy. Like this, this, is who, this is where these people came from. Uh, and, and I'm sure probably none of, none of you here have genealogies as your life verses, I'm sure, right? It's probably not like, oh, I just love going through and pouring through these genealogies. They're so amazing. They're so uh, interesting. But I think one thing we have to realize is uh, there's a reason these genealogies are in there. Actually, First Chronicles is the largest composition that we see here of genealogies, just tracing back people's lineages, where they came from, who their uh, you know, parents were, and what tribes they came from. Uh, so for example, we'll go to 1 Chronicles chapter 1, uh, 1 through 4, it starts off just like this. Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah, the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So right away, what are they doing? They're starting off and they're tracing all the way back to Adam. Right? That's important that they're doing that. So they're beginning, okay, we're, we're beginning, we're tracing it all the way back to Adam. And then go on to 1 Chronicles 2, 10 through 15. Ram was the father of Aminadab, and Aminadab the father of Nishan, uh, the leader of the people of Judah. Nishan was the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, Boaz the father of Obed, Obed the father of Jesse, Jesse was the father of Eliab, his firstborn, the second son was Abinadab, the third Shemaiah, the fourth Nathanael, the fifth Radai, the sixth Ozem, and the seventh David. Now, is that a coincidence that uh, now, we're, now we're heading up towards to David, right? So we start with Adam. Now in this part, we're, we're tracing it to David, David the seventh. And it's important, of course, for several reasons. Number one, when you, when you read genealogies, you might think, this is not entertaining. This is not fun to read. You know? and, and truthfully, us, even me, when I'm reading, I'm like, Ugh. now I did read all through it. I read through all the, the genealogies, not because I'm going to remember them, but it's more my OCD to say I read through them. I did it, you know, and I'm, I didn't skip over them. Uh, but it is important, a couple, couple reasons. Um, first of all, the, the, these books and the genealogies, even the Bible in general, they weren't written to entertain you. Shocking, right? They weren't, they weren't written to entertain you and, and all that kind of stuff. They're written for a very specific reason. They're written to tell you uh, and tell the people who you are, where you came from, um, who God is, what his plan for your life is. And so if, if, if you're reading it to try to just be entertained, then you're going you're gonna to miss out. Uh, now, certainly, this part of the, the genealogies, uh, they're very important. Several reasons. Number one, back in that day, that's before tape recorders, before, before cell phones, before even newspapers and things like that. And so families uh, would keep track of their lineage, right? To know where you came from. That was important. Also, they had very specific people um, that would chronicle. They would just sit in the king's palaces and they would chronicle the history of the people, right? And so essentially, we have chronicles. This is like the chronicles, the details of the Israelite people, the history of where they came from. And so they're very detail-oriented. Now, they don't do every single person, but they do what needs to be, as far as this goes, they do what they need to trace back. Uh, secondly, too, is ancestry is very, very important. If you were a Jew, you would find this very, 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 very important, right? Because first of all, um, in that culture, in that time, like, you had to be from certain tribes to be able to do certain things, right? If you wanted to be a priest, for example, what tribe do you have to be from? Anybody? No? Huh? That was a quiz question. You'd be Levite. Levites, that's, if you're in the priesthood, the priestly people, you come from the tribe of Levi. You'd be a Levite, very specific. So if you wanted to serve in the priesthood, you couldn't just show up and say, hey, I want to be in the priesthood, right? Uh, you had to be from the tribe. You had to be a Levite. But even more importantly, 
if someone showed up and said they were the Messiah, well, guess what? They tell you very specifically from prophecy, prophecies um, what tribe and line the, the Messiah would show up from. Um, in doing my study this week, I even watched a, um, Skip Heisig did a, did a study on this, and he talked about um, one time, he, he's a, a pastor of a big church, uh, this, they were doing a, a, a night Bible study, and so, someone came up and says, hey, there's, there's someone at the door, and you've got to meet this guy, he wants to meet you. And, and he's like, oh yeah? He, he said, uh, and Skip says, um, the guy, he says he's Jesus. Oh, okay. Like, and Skip said, you mean Jesus? He said, no, this guy says he's Jesus. And he's like, uh, okay. So he's talking to the guy. And, and so he's like, oh, so you're, so you're Jesus. He said, yep. And he, and he said, here is the new um, Third Testament. The Third Testament now. And he said, oh, who, who wrote this Third Testament? And the guy said, well, I did. And he said, okay. So now he's just, you know, he knows this guy's out there a little bit, and uh, well, way out there. And so he said, well, okay, um, just ask some questions. Um, where were you born? He said, I was born in Pittsburgh. <laughs> well, right, right now, you know the Messiah is not coming from Pittsburgh, right? Uh, and so again, uh, to know the lineage is super important because you know that the Messiah would descend from David, the line of David, right? Uh, and we see the tribes that will come from. Um, tribe of, of Judah, we see um, traced back through David. And again, this ch these chapters cover roughly 3,000 years. But just keep that in mind. Genealogy is very important, especially when you see when you're trying to figure out who the Messiah is. Because guess what? If you, when you go to the New Testament, how do they start off? Genealogies. They trace Jesus back. Right, uh, they're chasing back his lineages, to, or his lineage to where he comes from. So keep that in mind. Um, the purposes, the purpose rather, of some of the genealogies. Uh, let's go on. Chapter ten. Chapter ten is going to cover um, Saul. We we see actually. So the, this first portion, one through nine, covers like three thousand years. These next portion only covers like thirty years. And so you see the big difference, right? There's a big gap there. And so this kind of is like a divine editorial, if you will. So they're talking about. Uh, the history, they're talking about what's going on, but there's also some insight they're giving to why things happen per se, uh, or, or what's going on. So for example, go to chapter 10, 13 through 14, says this, Saul died because he was unfaithful to the Lord. He did not keep the word of the Lord and even consulted a medium for guidance and did not inquire of the Lord. So the Lord put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David, son of Jesse. So again, they're tracing that back. And so we see here, of course, um, the kingdom is, is, is taken from David, or, or is taken from Saul. Uh, the theme, of course, we see is obedience and blessing. We see disobedience and punishment, right? We certainly see that all throughout there. If you obey and walk in my ways, but, but if you don't, if you turn, uh, there's consequences to that. Uh, then we go on to chapter 11. Chapter 11 is going to talk about David's kingdom now, right? So now we're honing in on David's kingdom. Uh, so go to 1 Chronicles 11, 1 through 4, says this, all Israel came together to David at Hebron and said, We are your own flesh and blood. In the past, even while Saul was king, you were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns. And the Lord your God said to you, You will shepherd my people, Israel, and you will become their ruler. When all the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron, he made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel as the Lord had promised through Samuel. And so Israel, they're all coming together, they're rallying around David, and they're remembering that David said, or, or that, that God promised uh, what he would be their, their shepherd their people and, and rule their people. So go on to Hebrews 13, says this, um, actually, this is, we're fast-forwarding, obviously, to Hebrews and the New Testament. This is interesting how we might see a correlation here. So, um, so here they're rallying around David in, in the Old Testament. Fast-forward, go to 13, Hebrews 13 says, Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let us then go to him outside the camp bearing uh, the disgrace he bore, for here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for or with such sacrifice, sacrifices God is pleased. Then verse 17. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy and not a burden, for that 
would be of no benefit to you. And just real quick, like we see, so they're rallying around David, right? Rallying around him, coming around him. We can fast forward. We see a principle, certainly, um, in Hebrews here. So they're basically saying, don't make it hard on your leaders. Don't, don't be a pain for your leaders. Uplift them. Uh, because actually, when you make it hard on them, it's, it's no benefit to them, and it's no benefit to you, right? When you're making things hard and challenging on your leaders, whether it's causing dissension, whether it's, you know, whatever else the list can be, it says, just don't do that. Um, so here we see a principle uh, of, of coming together in that. And then go on to First Chronicles uh, 10 here. Uh, it says this, when all the elders of Israel had come to the king David at Hebron, he made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king of Israel, and the Lord had promised through Samuel. So we get me focused back on that verse. Uh, it's just really important because here the people recognize that, right? They recognize the importance for what? The theme of what? Unity? We've seen in loyalty, right? Unity and loyalty is a big theme here. So as God's people, we have to be unified and we have to be committed together. And that's such a key, key theme that we see. Like the old saying, you know, the old saying, um, divide and conquer, right? I think some people in politics try to do that. We want to divide people and then conquer people, right? But we see in God's, God's kingdom and also with God's people, the key thing is love, unity, loyalty. We are all coming together to worship God, to honor God, and to help advance His kingdom. And there can't be this making things hard on people, right? We see the theme of don't make it hard on your leaders. It's not beneficial to them, not beneficial to you. And also coming together in unity and loyalty. Uh, be fully dedicated to God. We see this here. Um, but also we see the idea of David is doing what God has anointed him and called him to do, right? And just imagine, imagine you in your life, can you, will you be a person that is just sold out to God for God's purposes? You ever think about that? Like, just, okay, um, as we are created, as we live our lives, can I be a man or can I be a woman of God? Someone who just, you know what? I want God to use me however he seems fit. God, how do you want to use me? Uh, David was passionately sold out. David was called what? He's the only person we see in the Bible called a man after God's own heart, right? Which might surprise us because we know a little bit about David. Like he wasn't perfect by any means. We know the story um, of, of his uh, trouble with, with Bathsheba he got into, right? Um, the adultery he got into, and then he conspired, and, and the murder he, he, he took place. But what we see though is David repented. That's a big thing, right? David repented. And he was seeking God. So if, so if some of you this morning are sitting here and thinking, man, God can never use me. Like, I'm way too flawed. I'm, I'm, I, God, you don't know my flaws. Well, the story of David should encourage you, right? I mean, the story of David should encourage you. All the, all the stuff that David went through, he was still called a man after God's own heart. Why? Because he, even though he sinned and messed up, he repented and still passionately wanted to seek God. He had humility. He wanted, God, how can you use me? And so I just say, like, man, can you imagine? God, I just want to be fully dedicated to you. I want to be a person who is passionate about you, who is seeking you. And just think about that. Like, what, what God could do through us if we would just be more available, be more open to it? Uh, and that's a key thing that we see here is being a man or woman of God. Just say, God, I just... I want you to use me in, in, a, in a big way. And God will use you in a way that you may not even realize, may not even understand, but you have to be available. And are you willing to do that? Just, I think the key thing we see with David is David's passion for God, a man for God's own heart. That should be our goal, to be people who are just passionately, God, how do you want to use me? And then don't limit yourself. Don't think that God can never use me. Because read this book. God frequently uses imperfect people, right? I mean, he uses people from all kind of shady backgrounds and pasts and things like that. And so uh, it does, doesn't matter what, where you've been, doesn't matter what you've done, uh, God can and will use you if you seek him and, and walk with him. And so go on, we're going to see, so the, first, the rest of First Chronicles deals with David's reign up to the transition of the next king. The next king is who? Oh, I'm quizzing you. Solomon, right? Solomon's going to be the next king. I'm going to do this every Sunday. Now, I'm just going to wait in silence as we see how anybody answers. Um, I'm, just, I'm just giving you a hard time. But now we see he's waiting. The, the next is covering the, the transition to, to King Solomon. A couple things as you, as you read this book. Uh, you're going to notice a couple things is 
Um, there are similarities to the previous books that we've read, right, in terms of uh, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings. But there's also some differences. What you might notice is there's some things left out here. Uh, you'll notice that they don't cover and talk about uh, David's turmoil with King Saul. They don't talk about uh, the trouble that he got into with Bathsheba. Uh, they don't get into Absalom's rebellion, his son's rebellion. They don't get into that. Why? Well, I mean, they're not trying to fool you or anything like that. But I'm saying this is written for a purpose. So the purpose of this, it was written to who again? It was written to returning Jews that were in exile, that were taken into captivity. Now they're starting to come back. And so this was written to encourage them. So he's not going to get bogged down into things that's going to discourage them, that's going to distract them. He's going to give them a word of hope, a word of encouragement. Because that's what he knows they need during this time. Um, and he's saying, he's trying to remind them who they are as God's chosen people. Trying to remind them that even though they had dark days, that there is future bright hope ahead. Right? That God's promise will f- be fulfilled. And so, again, another theme that we can see here uh, is that if you have a dark, dark time that you're going through, man, no matter what dark times you're going through, Your future is bright if you're with God, right? Uh, That no matter what you've been through, your future can be bright if you walk with God. And so don't get stuck back in the past. Don't get stuck back into negativity, into past failures and past mistakes and, and past troubles. But rather you look forward to what God can do through you and in your life. Because God is faithful, right? And you know what? Um... Even if you don't see a certain promise fulfilled this side of eternity, guess what? The future is very bright when you stand before him in the coming kingdom, right? And so we keep that in mind because it's all moving forward to a culmination, if you will. And so keep that in mind is, man, uh, don't get too discouraged that you are God's people. He loves you. He cares for you. He has a plan for you. And even though you might have been through some stuff, maybe you're going through some stuff now, your future can be bright right? Um, cannot even imagine what the Lord has in store for those that love the Lord, right? New Testament uh, uh, comes to mind. I can't remember what verse that is. Maybe you guys can tell me. Um, I can't remember. But go on now. We're going to see in chapter 12, we're going to see warriors join David in chapter 12, right? So if we go on to chapter 12, we see basically that people come from different tribes of Israel and they're going to be rallying around and pledging allegiance to to David. So we see this, for example, um, these were the men who came to David at Ziklag while he was banished from the presence of Saul, son of Kish. They were among the warriors who helped him in the battle. They were armed with bows and were able to shoot arrows or sling stones, right-handed or left-handed. They were relatives of Saul from the tribe of Benjamin. They helped David against raiding bands, for all of them were brave soldiers, and they were commanders in his army. Day after day, men came to help David until he had a great army, like the army of God. So we see this movement now away from Saul to David, right? They're, they're aligning themselves with David, and until eventually they're going to coronate David as their king. And then the next chapters are going to deal with David and, and the animosity that they have uh, uh, well, between Israel and the Philistines. We see this kind of animosity, right? We know the past story that David killed Goliath, right? He's been long gone, and they want, they want revenge. Go on to chapter 13 through 16. Uh, this is going to be going on to the moving of the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. Uh, if you remember what, the Ark of the Covenant was taken into um, captivity, if you will, or just taken um, by the Philistines. Uh, they eventually return it, and then David goes to move it, and they put it on a cart, and they're moving it, if you remember the story. And uh, Uzzah then, the, the ox, a stumble, and he tries to, to catch the ark or prevent it, and he touches it, and apparently that's a no-no, um, and he's struck dead uh, because of that. So he's punished for that uh, because there's a very specific way they were to be doing this. It's kind of a very weird, we don't really understand it, to be honest, fully. Um, even see, you saw David in this story. He laments. He couldn't couldn't believe that this happened. He was very very distraught and upset about this. Um, uh, but I think the key thing is to not take lightly what God says and, and walking in obedience. That's a theme that we can see for sure. Um, but but nevertheless, we see this. So they 
finally realize David says, you know what, we should do this the way the Lord says. They put it on poles and they carry it into Jerusalem and there's a big celebration going on. Uh, now chapter 17, here's a big thing. This is a big key portion. Chapter 17, God's promise to David. This is like the key section here. Uh, and if you remember, I said that before in the past of, of um, I think it's 1 Samuel 7, because this is a key focal point that we see in the Old Testament, especially in, in all of Scripture, really. Um, it's a covenant that God makes with David. So what we see as we're reading these books, the key focal point we see is um, we trace it back to God's covenant with Abraham, right? God's covenant with Abraham, and now God is making a promise and covenant with David that he will have a genealogical offspring, a lineage that will last forever. And, uh, and so then we see David, he wants to build a house for the Lord, right? He wants to build this great temple. He has it in his heart. And he tells the prophet uh, Nathan about it. And then Nathan basically says, oh, yeah, sounds great. Do, you, do whatever it is in your heart to do. That sounds like a great idea. Uh, and then God appears to, to Nathan in a dream. And this is what he says in 17, um, 7 through 15. God says this to Nathan. and says, Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name like the names of the greatest men on earth, and I will provide a place for my people Israel, and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning, and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel." I will also subdue all your enemies. I declare to you that the Lord will build a house for you. When your days are over and you will go on to be with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you. One of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for me, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. I will never take my love away from him as I took it away from your predecessor. I will set him over my house and my kingdom forever. His throne will be established forever. Nathan reported to David all the words of his entire revelation. And so we see God, so David is telling God, I'm going to build you this big house. I'm going to build you this magnificent house. And of course, in that day, there are all these big pagan temples and things like that. So he's, I'm going to, I'm going to do that. I'm a big house for you, this big temple. And, and, and God's, he's making plans. And God says, you know what? Uh, I'm going to build you a house. Um, not a literal house, but he's saying that your offspring, your lineage, he said, your son, it's going to be a line that will last forever, right? A, a, a kingship, a kingdom that will, will last forever. And so David's making plans for God, and God is saying, I got plans for you. I got, I got big, big plans for you that you might not even understand or realize that this line, this kingdom is going to establish. So what we see is this, covenant. Look at this covenant here. Two things for the covenant. Number one, David will have a son as a successor and build a temple. Solomon has Solomon. Solomon does that, builds Solomon's temple. We know that. Number two, the throne of David will be established forever. Note that Jesus is also called what? Son of David. You, you might see this different times in the Bible. It's not an accident that they're called Jesus calls them. If you actually remember, remember when Jesus goes to the, per, the, the demoniac, the person who's demon possessed, and they cry out, What? Jesus, son of David, what have you do to us? They already recognize who this is. Like them calling out. They know that Jesus is the long awaited and pointed Messiah who has the authority to cast them out and has the authority that God. The Father has bestowed upon him. And so this is key, key component, right? This is part of the covenant. And the, the kingdom that lasts forever, that is established forever, we see is fulfilled in, in Jesus, right? Uh, and so David's dynasty is interrupted for a period of time by the Babylonian exile uh, as they go into that captivity. But then Jesus will come to set people free from their sins, right? And then he's going to come again one more time. We call the second coming. And that is a time when... His, his kingdom will be established once and for all, um, forever, right? And all of those who uh, are, are covered with the blood of Christ, who have humbled themselves and have called upon the name of the Lord to be saved, uh, right, are, is part of that. And then those who have decided to rebel against God 
and to not uh, be part of that uh, will not be part of that, that coming kingdom. That's the theme that we see. Uh, I know it may not be popular to talk about in modern culture today, but that is what we see um, being illustrated here, that if you are not walking with God, that's your choice, but you're cutting yourself off from the life source, the only life source that can save you, um, and, but nevertheless. So that's what we see in, in terms of all of those things. Uh, I also want to say, too, is this is very important and key. Sometimes you might find reading the Old Testament hard, and that's honestly one of the reasons why we're doing this, is to help you better understand what in the world is going on in these books. You know, I, I remember hearing, in the, this is back when I was probably 10, 11, 12, there was a pastor at my church, and he was fine, he baptized me. Um, and, um, but I, I remember just years later hearing that his main thing is, he said he really was an Old Testament pastor, more of a New Testament guy. Uh, you're not going to understand the New Testament unless you understand what's going on in the Old Testament. You know, There would be no New Testament if there was not an Old Testament. And Testament means covenant, right? So you have Old Covenant, New Covenant. The little tip of the day, now you know, know what the word Testament means. Uh, but it's so key. Even Jesus' early followers knew how important this was. They were always drawing back on Old Testament prophecy, Old Testament things. So for example, on the day of Pentecost, uh, Peter gets up and he's going to quote from Psalm 16. And go to Acts, go to the book of Acts. Uh, Acts chapter 2, uh, Peter, when he gets up, and he, this is what he's preaching. He says this, Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and he was buried and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what it was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God raised this Jesus to life and we were all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises for you and for your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And so Peter is saying what? This promise is being fulfilled. This promise has been fulfilled. That's some key thing. I hope this, as you start reading this and you start thinking in terms of God's covenant and God's promise and God's purpose, that's always a theme. And now you see how it's carried out in this, through the people of Israel, and you see the promise coming Messiah. The kingdom will be established and last forever. And we see the importance of them drawing back on Jesus' genealogy, on, uh, on how can we trace him back to the line of David, right? Or the root of Jesse, another way of saying it. Because again, you know, son of David, that's just another way of, of, of they would talk in the day. Even like back in the day, for example, if you had a, a great, great, great grandpa named Bob, say Doc had a great, great grandpa named Bob, you could be, you know, Doc, son of Bob. And that was just a way they would speak to say what line you came from. But nevertheless, uh, now temple worship is going to be covered on in the rest of the book. Uh, David begins mapping out how the temple um, is going to be built through Solomon. First Chronicles 22 uh, we see this, we're not going to read through it, but basically just uh, David is telling, telling Solomon how he is going to build a house for the Lord, how Solomon is going to be the one to build the temple. David uh, is not allowed to build it. He's, the reason is he has too much blood on his hand. David, who's a warrior, apparently the temple cannot be built by someone who has, has, has done that much, uh, even though certainly some was uh, for sure appointed and, and had to be done, he was told to do. Uh, but nevertheless, that is the reason he see. Um, go to verse 10 at the very bottom. He says, He is the one who will build my house for my name. He will be my son, and I will be his father, and I will establish the throne of the kingdom of Israel forever. 
Um, real quickly, quick summary. Uh, chapters 20 through to 24 gives the divisions of the priesthood and their duties. That's what those chapters are all about, kind of laying those things, things out. Uh, chapter 25 we see is about the singers and the musicians. There's a big, big focus on singers and musicians, and they're being laid out on what's going on and how they're, they actually the word phrasing before is their ministry of music. It's considered a ministry, very, part, very much part. They minister in music. Uh, chapter 26 is about the, the gatekeepers and the treasuries, just kind of laying out those rules and laying out those things that they need to do. 27 we see is about army divisions, kind of giving out who's in charge of where. Chapter 28 covers David's plan for the temple, uh, kind of laying those out. Chapter 29 is uh, there's a, a gifts for building the temple, and David has a, an offering, and there's a big overwhelming response, right? That, they're, that, that people gather and they give gifts to get this thing rolling and offering for the temple. And uh, go on, to, we'll actually read this. First Chronicles 29 says this, The people rejoiced at the willing response of their leaders, for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. David the king rejoiced greatly. It says, Then David said to the whole assembly, Praise the Lord your God. So they all praised the Lord, the God of their fathers. They bowed down, prostrated themselves with the Lord and the king. They ate and drank with great joy in the presence of the Lord that day. And so they're just, since, since the, the joy and celebration and the, and the generosity, right? They're happy and joyful to give to, to the Lord for his honor, for his glory, for his advancement. Uh, and, and they're celebrating, and they're they're joyful. And we've talked about it before, but man, we should be we need to be people a little bit more joyful, celebrating instead of being so down in the dumps and, and slumping. You know, just let just let God's spirit, you know, get it on the inside of you and just say, man, like it's amazing that God made all of this. It's amazing that God made me. It's amazing that Christ died for me. He was raised again. I will be part of God's coming kingdom. That He was walking with me. He's not left me. Even though I go through struggling times, God will still uh, restore me and, and see me through. And just keeping this in mind uh, of a sense of gratitude and a sense of joy. But many times we don't. We just go around of what we don't have, everything that's wrong, all that kind of stuff. But we need to recapture the idea of celebrating the Lord and being joyful for the Lord. Uh, get, let it get on the inside of you instead of just going through the motions. Uh, now go on. We're going to see a summary of David's reign. We're almost done. First Chronicles 29 is basically that. It's a summary. Wrap it up. It says, David, son of Jesse, was king over Israel. He ruled over Israel 40 years. Seven in Hebron, 33 in Jerusalem. He died at a good old age, having enjoyed long life, wealth, and honor. His son Solomon succeeded him as king. As for the events of King David's reign, from the beginning to the end, they are written in the records of Samuel the seer, the records of Nathan the prophet, and the records of Gad the seer, together with the details of his reign and power and the circumstances that surrounded him in Israel and the kingdoms and all their lands. And so we see in the book of 1 Chronicles um, two focus. The human focus is on who? David. The overarching focus is on the kingdom, right? We see David, his life, what's going on, and the overarching focus is God's kingdom. Um, his covenant with Abraham, covenant with David, Solomon taking over. That line, that kingdom will be endured. And you may just fast forward to the New Testament. They begin with tracing Jesus of Nazareth back to his lineages. This is the fulfilled promise, the Messiah, that we see in this. And so I just say this is, um, the book ends on a peaceful note. Right, Solomon's now king, and there's kind of um, we see a peaceful thing happening here. Uh, but I would just say it's kind of a preview of coming attractions because we see as we fast forward all the way to the end of the book in Revelation, talks about when the new kingdom fully comes. Right, this thing is not over. Like God, God has promised a promise to His people Israel. Right, He promised a covenant. He promised all of this stuff. He promised the coming Messiah. Christ has been raised from the dead. All these things fulfilled, you know, there's still a, a promise that Christ is going to return again. God's kingdom is going to be established forever. And uh, we see that picture that God is going to wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away, right? He said, behold, I make all things new, he says. 
uh, in Revelation. And so with the theme we need to see is, listen, there's a great promise coming. There's a great hope coming. Even though things look dark and bad, know that God is a God who fulfills his promises, right? God is a God who fulfills his promises. All the way through, we see he has been faithful. He does that. He has not abandoned his people, even when it looked like it, even when they thought it. He has not. And then we also keep our future mind on the coming kingdom. Now, we still have things to do here and now. We're to be living out kingdom lives now, God using us in ways to help bring people into the kingdom, to, to care for people, to do his will on earth as it is in heaven here and now. But also, man, there's a coming day when it's going to be amazing when God restores all things the way things intended to be. Uh, and I just want us to see all of these things. There's a lot of stuff in there, but, but see... Can we be a people like David who has a, a heart, a man or a woman who has a heart after God, right? Uh, but keep all that in mind. Yeah, there's practical things in here that we learn of things to do and not to do, but also keep the overarching understanding of this book of the kingdom, God's promises being fulfilled. We see that in Christ, the Messiah, and we see that pointing to the new heavens and the new earth. And again, we see the importance of all of that. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for every single person that's here. God, sometimes when we read Scripture, we can get bogged down by not understanding things or, or trying to understand them. But help us to better understand your word, better understand your promise. And God, help everybody here recognize and realize that you are a God that fulfills their promises. And God, no matter if we're going through dark times or going through challenges or struggles, help them to know that you will see them through. You will never leave them nor forsake them. And God, I pray that you pour out more of your Holy Spirit upon all of us, God. Fill us with your power. Fill us with your presence. God, let our hearts be so on fire for you that we just want to seek you more and more to be considered and be called a man or a woman after God's own heart, and how you will use us, how you could use us for your glory and for your purpose. But help us to also rejoice and celebrate like we see in here, to be a people who are so thankful and joyful for who you are and what you've done, but that also reflects in how we treat people. God, guide us and lead us and help us see and pray. As we pray in the Lord's Prayer, Father, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray that, God, one of the ways in which that is done is through your people. Help us to do that and keeping our mind on the coming kingdom as well. We thank you and praise you in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen.